Uh, well, we'll see. Hello, everybody. Hello. Welcome. Welcome to the December 22 version of the Larry Durker chapter Saber meeting. I am Joe Thompson, your uh, chapter president. And I would just like to say happy holidays to all of you. Okay? All of you. Back then. And uh, I just have to say that uh, everybody's kind of in the mood, the holiday mood, even uh, Keith? No. Kevin. Kevin. See, I'm terrible name. Kevin's wore, Kevin wore a authentic Christmas t-shirt. Would you like to remind everybody? Nakatomi Plaza. <laughs> Greatest Christmas movie of all time. Yes. Die Hard. Die Hard is a Christmas movie. <laughs> all right, everyone. Um, I got my... Hold on. I got... All right. I'd just like to say welcome to our special guest, Tony, who's actually right here. Tony Adams. Hello. And uh, David Vaught. There are our special uh, guests tonight, our speakers. We also have other guests. We have, well, four new, four first timers tonight. Four. All right. Four. Quattro for you, Mike. <laughs> right. uh, first off, we have uh, Keith. Again, I'm not going to try to. Keith's a friend of Ted. Thank you, Ted. Kobe. How are you? Please don't think it's weird, but I met Kobe online. <laughs> <laughs> I met, met, met him on Twitter. Um, I had talked to him a couple of years ago, and then I sent him another message the other day. And he's like, yeah, I, I want to join. You know, I would love to come and meet all of y'all. So, Kobe, welcome. You know, <clears throat> welcome. Paula. Paula is here specifically for Tony. <laughs> right? Because of Tony. You call him a, quote, rock star? Yes. Tony is a rock star. So, because of you, we have another first time. So, welcome all. Um, so, today, I'm uh, I going to talk a little bit. Well, Tony is number four. Tony has never been to a meeting before, but he's a member. You know, so, he's more than welcome to Come back. So, thank you, Mike. Thank you very much. Uh, I would just like to say it's been a great first year as chapter president. If it wasn't for Mike, I'd be lost every meeting. You know? So, thank you, Mike. <laughs> but all of you have uh, made the transition from uh, our president emeritus, Bob. To me, y'all made it so much easier um, on me. So, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to many more years. Um, standing in front of you, I guess. <laughs> All right. Um, I guess we could start off by saying, are the Astros done mo making moves? Are they done? No. Uncle Mike signed yesterday, right? Yes. Should we be done? Yeah, no. Why should we spend four hundred million on somebody like Judge, right? Or three hundred and how many million? For Carlos Correa, anybody surprised by that? The Carlos Correa move, Tony. Why are you surprised by the Carlos Correa move? He's aging rapidly. Okay, all right. So you're saying he's going to opt out in a couple of seven years? Five times two seventy five, right? Does he not have an, uh, a a uh, no trade? Well, yes, no, yes. No, no opt out. Uh, right, right. Thank you, Bob. Uh, on Saturday, we were talking about this contract. There is a no opt out. There is a no trade. So they got him for 13 years, I guess. Now, a lot of us, we're going to see in about 10 years, we see all these teams are going to be thinking because they have the two salaries still there and they can't turn to no trade. All right. Yeah, exactly. I think we may trade for Brian. We may trade for Brian Reynolds. I, I hope that'll be something. 
Yeah, so do I. So do I. We have somebody in the room who has a little experience with MLB contracts. Cal, what do you think of all this money that's being thrown around? <laughs> it's outrageous. It's outrageous? <laughs> but what are we, at $2 billion now or something like that? Something crazy, man? So uh, it, it is wild. Um, Bill Brown is not on the call, but uh, in case you don't know, Browning has a new book. It's his first jaunt into the world of baseball fiction. All right. So uh, if you're looking for last minute Christmas gifts, check out Brownie's book. You know, here, I'll pass it around for you. Clinging for glory. I have a lot of time to read. You see how far I've gotten into this? <laughs> okay. So, um, also, if you're looking for another book for Christmas, there's a new book about Ken Caminetti. I don't know if y'all know that. Uh, it actually came out in May. It's called Playing Through the Pain, Ken Caminetti and the Steroids Confession that Changed Baseball Forever. So that's another book if you're thinking about. Oh, so check play, it out. Playing Through the Pain. Playing Through the Pain. It should be about. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, that is true. That's true. So um, I'm going to ask the author, Dan Good, to speak with us at a later date. So we'll kind of see how they go. Any of you in here um, like a fan's guide to baseball analytics? I picked this up from Amazon. You know, pretty good book. Yeah, real, real good. <laughs> yeah so I'll, I'll pass I'll pass this around. Hey, sure I'm interested. Where's Bill's book, please? Bill's book is available on Amazon, everywhere else, a Kindle version, paperback version. A um, couple other things here. Is your information on Sabre's website correct? Okay. You know, you can check, log in to Sabre to make sure your information is correct. All right. You can log in, make sure they have the right email address. Uh, if you don't know, they send out a This Week in Sabre every week. Um, if you're not getting that stuff, maybe your email address is wrong on Sabre's website. If you're not getting renewal notifications, and that's a good segue into if you haven't renewed your membership, please go ahead and renew membership. Um, I had to do that a couple months ago, so make sure you do that. Make sure you check that. Um, Astros Fan Fest is January 21st. Third. I, uh, Bob and Third. I were talking on Saturday gonna maybe try to check something out see if we can work on something right boss maybe we can have an end at fans fest maybe we can have a booth or something yeah we're gonna try to have a booth set up uh uh, we expect, you know, they expect between uh 10 and 15,000 people to show up depending upon how many players come and we have a good yeah. opportunity to uh introduce saber to the people who come in and as an incentive we give away free baseball cards to every kid who comes by our booth yeah, exactly. That's how I found out about Saber. That's why I'm here because she was at the booth at Fan Fest back in uh, Funny story. That's how I found out about Saber back in 2010. And I talked to Bob. Man, a booth. <laughs> so, yeah. No, it didn't trade baseball cards. It was three years apart, Mike. <laughs> um, any of y'all ever heard of the Savannah Bananas? Yes. Yep. They're coming to Constellation Field in March, March 16th to the 18th. It's sold out, I think. The first day is sold out. I, I looked online to see the prices of tickets. About 100 bucks. Oh, my goodness. They are the Harlem Globetrotters of baseball. Uh, Josh Reddick played on for them last year, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, they have that coming to Constellation Field. Uh, March 16th to the 18th. You have to be put on a waiting list. Good luck with all that. Hopefully, uh, we can talk with somebody that knows a little something about the uh, Sugar Land team, and maybe we could uh, possibly have a booth there. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe we can talk to somebody. Uh, especially if the game's being sold out like that. That'd be a good way to promote Sabres. March 16th to the 18th. Fan Fest is January 21st. Okay. All right. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to check out the chapter newsletter, we had a really good edition this last time. 
really good stories. Uh, Tony, the next one's supposed to come out sometime in February or March or something. I still believe it. Or a enthusiast, uh, spray training. But again, we need material. We need first class material to publish because we don't publish it any time. Uh, or it's not. Uh, so, uh, anyway, please keep your email address. Have some things not that big. We don't really turn anything down. <laughs> <laughs> we went from first class of material, so we don't turn nothing down. They fix it in the end. Oh, oh, you know, so hey, just, just, just send Tony something. Deadline's mid-January, so send Scott something, anything. Send Tony and Scott something? <laughs> All right. Um, so, what's that? One on there you go. Have something on Kim Caminetti. Um, and that should come out sometime in uh, the end of February. On Saturday, we had a uh, another meeting. Kobe, you wanted to come, didn't get a chance to. That's fine. We'll have another Saturday session. I think I'm going to stick with this because uh, you know some people like like it. I mean, there was only a few of us on Saturday. Patrick is not here tonight. Uh, one of our uh, more recent uh, members, he's on a uh, trip up to his hometown, Rochester, I think. So that's why he's not here. Uh, we had a good talk. Uh, Maxwell told us, gave us a little preview of David's book. So, uh, David, you <laughs> will uh, be able to give us more information about your book later. But uh, Maxwell gave us a little preview of David's book. Um, we also talked about the uh, off-season moves. And we also spent some time talking about potential speakers for 2023. A couple of names that came up were Mike Floyd, uh, Randy Smith, pal, <laughs> <laughs> um, former Astros GM Ed Wade. You said Bill Wood too, right, Bob? Didn't you say Bill Wood? Yes. Brian McTaggart and the um, guy who wrote the Caminati book. I also like to yeah. talk with... Huh? Julie Morales. Julie Morales, but she's yeah, Julie Morales. I think her name maybe came up too. But we're having Allison. Allison. Oh, wow. Next one. Okay. Um, but I would like to ask Brownie to come back and talk and talk about this whole process. Is how different it was to write a fiction book compared to everything else he's ever written. So uh, he's talked about it a little bit. I just wonder what the difference is in the process of this mindset. You know. Um, Maybe it's a game he always wanted to see. Maybe it's a game he always wanted to see. Okay. Or announce. Uh, very quickly, uh, anybody uh, planning on going to the Roger Hornsby winter meeting? It's January 7th, the first time they're doing it face to face in a couple of years. So, so that's what I hear. Okay. It's January 7th at Texas State. Um, Gilbert Martinez, the uh, chapter president over there, give me some information. Um, David, are you talking about that? What do you mean? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, so I guess that answers uh, because Gilbert told me that they're going to have an author of Gaylord Perry. And ironically, <laughs> I guess we beat the Roger Hornby chapter. <laughs> <laughs> So we're getting a preview. Um, there's going to be presentations about uh, Ben Scully, um, Aaron Judge's uh, 60-second home run, uh, Mike Caps. We all know Mike. He's going to talk. Uh, and also author of a recent book about Charlie O. Finley. So that's January 7th, 2023. So hopefully you can join us. Uh, I'll be there. Um, let's see who else uh, can go. Um, our next chapter meeting is going to be January 16th. Our special guest will be Allison Footer. Okay. Um, so please come back for that. We're going to have another uh, Saturday talk. That'll be January the 14th, starting at 11 a.m. Unless for some reason they move the winter Roger Hornsby meeting to January 14th. We'll have to work that out. And a little bit later down the line, not too far away, Sabre just announced that uh, Sabre Day in America is going to be February 4th, 2023. That's a Saturday. And Mike, we usually have it at across the street, 
right? Jack's or whatever that place is. Sure. Yeah. So I would like for all, all of us to get together for Sabre Day in America. Last year, Bob put it together. Everybody bought a piece of memorabilia and told a story about it. We can have a book exchange. Believe me, I have lots of books and memorabilia I can exchange with anybody. Okay. Uh, please come. It's a Saturday morning. We could have a you know, good sit down and talk for a couple hours, some baseball stuff, just in time for uh, spring training. Okay. So uh, we'll talk about uh, that a little bit later on. So, Tony, our very first guest tonight. Uh, I got us primed and warmed up a little bit. And I'm going to turn it over to our special guest, Tony Adams. Has anybody, does anybody in here know that name? Anybody, who does not know Tony Adams? Tony knows Tony Adams. <laughs> anybody online not know who Tony Adams is? Okay. Yeah, he's that guy. Yeah, your brother does. Huh? Yeah. Your brother? <laughs> well, I hope your brother <laughs> But we had quite a few people in here that don't know the name Tony Adams. You know, the trash can scandal with the Astros. Do we know, did everybody in the room know about that? No. Well, Tony, you kind of made a name for yourself because of that, right? Uh, yes. Fortunately, yes. <laughs> yeah. Tony is an Astros fan, though. Um, he's a Houston based graphic designer and web developer who spent more than 60 hours, 60 hours. You know, I can't get through Game of Thrones. And this guy is going to sit down for 60 hours writing an application to analyze video and audio footage and logging the details of the 2017 Astros sign-stealing operation. His results are available at signstealingscandal.com. I've checked that out in, hey, data-friendly people in here. There you go. That's your website. Um, Adams, he won an award for this, the 2021 Safer Contemporary Baseball Analysis Award for his work. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Tony Adams. Be very interesting. Go ahead, Tony. Thank you. Uh, uh, do we want to switch over to the uh, to my screen here? Give me control. Is that? Okay, here. Okay. All right, just give me a second here. Okay. okay. Uh, what I thought I would do is kind of uh, go through the process of how I got in this position and how I uh, decided to to do this this project. Um, Can everybody online hear you? Hear Tony? Can everybody hear Tony? Uh, you get a couple of thumbs up is over here. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, I'm an Astros fan going back to the late seventies when I was very young, you know, Jose Cruz and, and uh, Cesar Cedeno, Joe Necro, Terry Poole. Uh, and obviously I suffered through the, uh, the ups and downs of, of, of Ash, being an Astros fan all the way to uh, 2017. And 2017 was, was up for Astros fans. That was just an amazing event. And uh, for me, it was, uh, I just lost my house in Harvey. And it was really something for me that, uh, it was very emotional. I'm still kind of emotional about it. Uh, and so that was such a great feeling. And it, it took me actually a while to kind of process it. For three months, I was kind of uh, wondering, did I dream that? Is it real? But yeah, it, it was real. And then obviously fast forward to November uh, of 2019, when the, the Athletic came out with the article about the science feeding scandal. Um, and initially I was really uh very hurt and <laughs> just kind of uh disappointed i guess is the best word i could use uh uh but then the media uh, hype just started with it and and also the social media aspects of it uh, just kept uh 
snowballing. I'm sorry. I need to just real quick to give me that. Yeah, I'm getting a big echo here. Uh, and there's so much uh, misinformation out there. Uh, I remember one video uh, looked at game six, or game five of the 2017 World Series, and they were trying to log the, or the charge whistles that they heard and say that those were signals for breaking balls. And they showed five pitches that had a, a, a charge whistle before it, and it was a breaking ball. When uh, LA threw 190 pitches in that game, and they showed five pitches, try to say that, that the dash is receiving this just, just, uh, just charge whistle. And as Astros fans, you know, that's the charge whistle. <laughs> it may have been. I mean, you, you hear it all the time. And, and uh, I believe somebody here was saying in game five, there was so much noise that you really couldn't hear yourself, you know, the person next to you. Uh, and, think, uh, and so that kind of, uh, that type of, uh, Misinformation that was out there was really getting me uh, very upset. You know, I was trying to figure out what's the truth of this. So I actually, what I did is I, I listened to Game Five, which is a five-hour and ten-minute game, uh, and logged every charge was like here, and there were over forty charge whistles, and only eight were before breaking balls for the Astros. So if you, you know, that was an example of how people could manipulate the situation and the data to show. Something that wasn't really true. Um, so, but what that did is it showed me, um, it got me looking at the audio uh, of games. And uh, from there, I thought, well, maybe I could take that and uh, uh, do an app that would allow me to log the bangs, trash can bangs. Um, and uh, so I did a, I'm a web developer by trade, I, I program and uh, develop applications. Uh, in Python, uh, which is a programming language. And uh, so I started to write a web app based, that would allow me to model the uh, the data for a game and that bat if a player in a pitch, and also add uh, other uh, data that I could get from MLB. But I, I didn't want to listen to every game because that would be over 200 hours worth of games. It would have been fun to, to watch all the games again, but that's just not an efficient way to, to do this process. So as I was looking at the data that MLB provides, I noticed that each pitch had a timestamp. And uh, I also had the videos, there were videos of the full games on YouTube. So I could download those full videos. And with that timestamp, I had an aha moment that I realized that I could sync up the first pitch timestamp to the first pitch in the video, and then I could use the other timestamps um, to jump between <laughs> to jump between the different pitches, and that way I could just listen to the pitches and not all the other stuff in between. I could skip the commercials, I could skip the, the chatter, um, and uh, do this fishing list. Fishing is possible. They're also allowed me to, to jump around and uh, go to different pitches uh, um, as, as, as I needed to. So uh, this is the app, uh, some of the code that I wrote. Uh, here you can see this is uh, the model of a, of a pitch. And so it basically has uh, which pitch number it is, pitch result, um, what type of pitch, uh, which game it's related to. Um, but it also, here I also have the pitch type, which is if I heard a bang, or if I heard two bangs, or if I heard nothing. Um, so I was able to download all the videos, download the data for all, and there's 58 games that were on YouTube, home games. And, and there are only uh, 79 home games that year because we had three in, in, in Tampa that year because of Harvey. And so I had most of the games. Uh, and uh, uh, so, um, I did a couple of games near the end of the season to, to, to do a test, uh, the Chicago series, because we knew from the, from the, uh, athletic article that there was banging during that last game where, uh, Danny Farquhar recognized that he heard the banging and stepped off the mound, and that's when, uh, uh the Astros actually stopped at that point. 
But so, so I, 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 I listened to that game and another game. Just to test it. No, no, this was this is regular season. Oh, right. It was uh, late August. August. I'm sorry, late September. And um, um, so, so I did, I did those, those and the, the application was actually working very well. And I was very uh, uh, pleased. Uh, I did a spectrogram, which is a video, uh, which was a, a visual representation of each pitch. Excuse me, my throat is a little. So the spectrogram that I can show you here. Uh, what it is, is, is this is a visual representation of, of, of a pitch here. And uh, as I scroll through or play this, you can see the bangs down here in the low frequency. Uh, you may not be able to hear it here, but. Uh, uh, and, and here's, here's another bank over here. here. This, this is, is as we're playing, this is all the audio from, from, from the broadcast. The announcers are talking. talking. But when the pitch is uh, being given, you can see down here, here's a bank. I was able to see that and also hear that. that. You all see that down, down here? here? Yeah, I can't hear you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. I guess my volume's way down. How soon before the pitch arrived in the bank happened? What's, what's the timing of that? I'm sorry. sorry the, the bang. What's the timing of the bang prior to the prior to the prior to the pitch or was it, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was it was like, like a, a second, second after the uh, the pitch was the signal from the catcher. catcher. Uh, so how much time did the hitter have to assimilate like three, three seconds, seconds maybe. maybe? How much? Maybe, maybe three, three seconds. seconds. I can I show you it in the app here, here in a second. second. So, so uh, I'm sorry, now I'm getting an echo. Uh, so, so, um, um, uh, so, so I, I, I got, got I got, got the app running, running uh, and, and then I started, started on the process of, of going, going through each game. game. And uh, for some so reason, I didn't really think about how many pitches there were, but there was over eighty two hundred pitches that I had to listen to. <laughs> and uh, so that was actually became the uh, the fatigue of that was actually one of the issues of just making sure that I was doing it right. Uh, focusing um, on getting it done. But so let me show you that this, this is the front end of the app that I had. So, so this, this is all the games, games from uh, the home games from that year. Uh, and this, this I've already processed this. So you can, this is the April 3rd game against the Mariners. Uh, if you look at, uh, if I scroll down here, over here, you'll see a chart, uh, a bar chart of all the different bangs. Uh, for that particular game, you can see that. Uh, Earlier in the season, season, nothing, but there are a few there. And what, what that is, is actually, it's, it's basically statistical noise. I, I, if I heard something that could have been a trash can bag, I had to, to put it down. So I'm really afraid, of, um, particularly being an Astros fan, if I didn't put everything down, it could possibly be uh, a trash can bag. So it would come up and say, well, you didn't log this one. So and then they would try to validate all the data that I had. So, so these early ones, ones are probably just somebody, somebody you know, know hitting the uh, cushion or, or you know something. Something, somebody somebody dropped something. something. You know, there's noise in the stadium all the time. So, so uh, these early ones, ones are almost certainly not, not real trash can bags. But you can see here, it started uh, in late May. That's when it really started. Uh, if I go into this game, you can see. This is, this is the process that I went through. I would have a game. I would just start with the first pitch. And, um, So what I would have to do is I would go to each one. Of them. And again, he's got full complement of pitches. He's got starter stuff. And he gets ahead of Springer. Well, an unfamiliar is an asset. I had headphones on. None of the hitters in the Astros lineup has ever seen Alec Ackman. 
And if I heard a bang, but they've seen the film, I and it's not the same. The and, you know, that's why we'll see how he fares. Uh, Hopefully, gets uh, gets through the lineup. Two or three. Up lineup has ever faced Alec Ashley. You can see it jumps right to the next pitch. I'm going to stop this for a second so we I can just explain it. So what the the, the data by the jump hits the pitch. So it was extremely efficient. It's like 10 seconds for each pitch. If you're talking about 8,200 pitches, um, it ends up being about 40 hours or so. And I did go back and listen to some other, uh, uh, like when I found out that Altuve wasn't participating, I went back and listened to all of Altuve's pitches again, to just to make sure that I was correct. Because I, I, I knew that that would be something that people were interested in. Okay. So, um, Is it very hard for you to detect the- Extra 34, uh, no. On the home I'll give you an example of one where there is one. Uh, <laughs> this is the actual the, the Farquhar game against the White Sox. This is where uh, uh, Danny Farquhar recognized um, that, um, what the Astros were doing and stepped off. And so here in this, the walkway but going leads to the that the players in the dugout yeah they had a monitor that was set up behind the dugout uh it was focused the camera was focused on the catcher's signals and then somebody had a bat on that, or sometimes I had a, a, a massage gun, and they would just bang on a plastic trash can. And that's that deep kind of uh, bass drum. <laughs> and that's why you see it low on the, the frequency here. You can see, I can tell right here, this, this, is, a, this is a bang here. Uh, the Astros hit around the Oakland right-hander in that start. Yeah. Yeah. Two pitches a line drive yeah, up the middle. Down. Close to 300 since coming back to the deal. This looks like it is a bang. This is something else. That might have been that might have been that might have been that. And here, this is a, a change up. And so there would be no bang. So this is my process. I have to do this 200 times. All the bags. The last can has hit at least 20 in only four innings. Oh, uh, that data I don't have here. And one of the things I was trying not to do was to do any sort of analysis on this. I was trying to log the, the, um, the data because I'm not a statistician and I felt I would probably mess that up more than I would, you know. Uh, um, and uh, so I, one of the things I was really in, wanted to do is make sure that this, this data that I was creating tied into the MLB data so that the, um, the statisticians could actually use it to do some analysis. And there have been several analysis done. And the issue is, is that they frequently signal a breaking ball when it wasn't a breaking ball. So that is actually, obviously, if you're expecting a breaking ball, you get a fastball. That's, that's a very big negative for the hitter. So, um, when it worked, it was it was very beneficial. But when it they got the wrong signal, it was very. I'm sorry, I didn't clear. I guess I I was thinking what I was hearing that it was more often that the the, the pitches that the batters took and then swing. You know, the percentage of the ones that were taken right. rather, rather than rather than just something that hit. Right. Uh, there were there was some analysis about that, that that they were more selective and then they would not swing it at breaking balls as much. Um, there's also uh, which obviously uh, is beneficial because then you wear down the pitcher, he gets more uh, a higher pitch count, and uh, uh, and then you have better success against them. There's also uh, some, some analysis that was done that said that uh, power numbers actually went down because they, if you think about it, uh, a batter has been spending his whole career working on a certain approach at the plate. 
And a lot of it is very reflexive. They see the pitch, they hit the pitch. But now they have the signal that's coming in and they have this cognitive process that's now in their head. Instead of reacting to the pitch, you're having to think, well, here's a breaking ball coming. And, um, and there have been a lot of players throughout our history that did not like to get the signal, even if there's a man on second. They just don't want to get the signal um, um, because it just, like Altuve, he's, I think he just likes to see the pitch and doesn't really matter. He's going to swing at it anyway. <laughs> but um, um, Did they bang for fastballs or bang? No, for they bang for they bang bang for breaking ball. balls. Okay. So the, no bang meant that there was it was a, it was a fastball. So a change up would be a breaking ball. Uh, uh, that would. So they bang for uh, sliders, curveball, basically. Um, and there is some thought that, that, that maybe they were also banging for position where the, where the location of the pitch was going to be, where the pitcher was setting up. But that, could, that gets to be complicated for them. That and try and microseconds you have from the time of pitch right. right. And the analysis shows that, that some players, I think, um, were it was more beneficial for some players than other other players. Marvin Marvin Gonzalez, obviously, he had a very good year that year. And I think he might have been the type of player where that type of information would have been beneficial. Um, yeah. Other players, they're more of a, you know, uh, like I said, a reaction or reflex type of hitter and get that information. It, it changes, like I said, it changes the process um, of hitting. And uh, I think it, would, it hurt them. So the, the overall analysis, most of the analysis that I've seen or that, that, that um, have come out have shown that if there was any benefit, it was very minimal you know people say that well you know if i knew the pitch what trish was coming i could hit a home run each time well first of all you can't but they didn't know the pitch each time and you have to think too if the first time you get a wrong signal if you're expecting a fastball you get a breaking ball or the other way around the next time you get a signal are you going to trust it you know so then you got another process in your head about is this guy right you know or is the signal right and so you almost kind of go back to where you were anyway, you know, where you're just looking at the pitch and, and reacting to it. But they only did this at home games. Home games. O- only at home games. And they had a higher winning percentage on the road that year and a higher team batting. And a higher team batting average. Yes. They did it start in May, I think, right now? They may. So, from a scouting method, was there any kind of control on doing this, like on away games or looking on other times to see, like when the, the opposing team was up, just to hear the sound the same way if you could pull it down. Well, there is. All right. Well, the control is the earlier in the season where they were they hadn't started yet, and also the Farquaad game is the, the the Chicago game in uh, September twenty first, where Danny Farquaad was a reliever for the Chicago White Sox was pitching and he noticed that when he was throwing a breaking ball there and he would hear this bang. And so when he, the catcher signaled the breaking ball and he heard it, he stepped off. And this is in uh, the commissioner's report and then in the, in the article that, um, and called his catcher out and said, they got our signals. And so when the Astros saw that, they immediately uh, took down the monitor and hit it in the office if you see here, this this is the, the game here on September 20, 21st, and there were no bangs uh, for the rest of the regular season. Uh, there's These are probably st- st- statistical noise. And if you look at this actual game here, this is um, this is pitch by pitch here. Um, you can see that there's, there's bangs through the first few innings. And then... Um, Uh, the last few innings here. This is actually where, where it happened. You can see that there's a bang. This is a Danny Farquaad against Evan Gaddis. Uh, there's a bang here. And after this pitch is when, here, I'll, I'll show y'all. So you can't, so you can hear that bang, bang. Ralph uh, Bow. So on this next pitch, 
Uh, it was about eighty percent of the time. Say a little bit more than that. Beltron and Guriel, and we're going to three seven. In a um, anyway, so at that point, he stepped off, and um, and that's when the Astros knew that they were caught. And they stopped for the rest of the season. So those last few games, there was no banging. Uh, and Mark Wall actually said that when he, uh, he, he was waiting for a reporter to come up and ask him what was going on, we were ready to tell them he wasn't going to, uh, to volunteer that information on what happened, but he was waiting for a reporter to ask. And, he did it. and um, that actually probably would have changed quite a bit if they actually had asked him because that would have broken it right then and then we wouldn't have any sort of uh, uh, thoughts that, that they were cheating during the play, the, the postseason. So. There was an issue um, with the audio. I've listened to the audio. I listened to the, to the, the first round and I can't, and I, the, the audio is very clear and I, I don't hear it banging. The, the uh, ALCS against the Yankees, um, the audio gets a little bit worse. And I think it's because the noise is getting uh, much greater in the crowd. And I think that the, uh, the broadcast has to start filtering for that and, and, and clipping that. So I can't hear uh, that low end that you're seeing there. And it's even worse for the World Series. It's just a bunch of static down there. Um, so I can't say for sure. Um, you know, uh, Correa said that, that the trash can was there and they tried it, but you got to think that an, an audio signal is uh, uh, is flawed if when you get into the postseason and the crowd noise is so great. And you all been to Minute Maid when it's really noisy. It, 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 it's, it just seems like it wouldn't work. Um, and then you'd also get more mistakes. Uh, um, are the, the batter is not quite hearing the, uh, the signal correctly. And um, um, so I think they probably tried it and it wasn't effective uh, and they stopped. And if they did try it, it wasn't very often. Um, we don't know that for sure. There's a lot about this that we really don't know. Um, uh, I think Beltran was some, from what I understand. Well, we did know that Beltran was a ringleader, and he brought it over from the Yankees. They were using it over there. Right. We signed him for that year. Uh, right. And he would Ring leadership to this team. <laughs> we had a lot of rookies, and they were starting to say, I think it's that. I don't mean, like it. He has to stop. Right. 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 Exactly. He has to throw the monitors twice, and they put it on the side. Twice. That's what I'm going to say again. You know, um, but everybody was doing it. It wasn't like it was something new. You know, I've heard a lot of, 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 um, of, of um, one of the problems with the Astros is that banging on a trash can was really, really dumb. Yeah, it was really a, a, a dumb way to signal this. And we're sophisticated ways to do it. And uh, you know, and people talk how the Astros it was a, it was a sophisticated sign stealing scandal, and it really wasn't. They were banging on a trash can to signal the pitch. <laughs> you know, there wasn't a light in, in the in the uh, in the uh, scoreboard like there was um, uh, supposedly with the White Sox in the eighties, um, or you know, just somebody in, in the in the bullpen waving a, a towel or something would have been better because. You don't have that uh, on, on camera. You can't, or it's not part of the broadcast. But this was so obvious. I mean, I'm listening to these these games, and it, it's so clear. Um, it's it's actually kind of amazing that nobody picked it up before Farquaad did, um, and then allegedly MLB was was um, informed of suspicions that the Astros were doing this, and I can't imagine that. That they would have listened to the game and not noticed that this was going on, you know. Was this something that was pretty easy to pick up if you had not been looking for this? If there hadn't been any, if there hadn't been any report, if there hadn't been any speculation, and you were just listening to the audio 
with without you know, without expecting this? Is this something that you would have discerned? I think the the the, the uh, it's very clear that what's going that the, the, the banks are there. Now making that connection to that's a breaking ball is something that um, I think probably eventually would have been been found out, and and particularly if Fal Farco ever came out and said, you know, this is what I heard. Once you have that. Um, uh, you can go back to that incident and then hear the bangs and then you know what's going on. Um, but, uh, uh, it, you know, it would it may not, never have been picked up, you know, but the problem with this is that once it was, it's so obvious there's no denying it, you know. Uh, the other teams who, who, was, who have been accused of stealing signs. I'm surprised that people that sit in the area of the of the home dugout wouldn't be aware of uh, I, uh, yeah i mean it, 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 it it's it's kind of dumbfounding now obviously anybody that was in the dugout they they knew what was going on uh, all the pitchers knew that we're sitting in there and all the players knew so that's another issue is that there's no deniability for anybody that was in that dugout because it was it was it was right there behind the dugout i mean you couldn't see it uh, from the field, but I mean, they all go back there to use the bathroom, get a drink or whatever, you know. Um, so uh, they they all knew what was going on. Um, uh, but, you know, again, it, I think it's hard to kind of hear that and then um, just kind of, you don't really think that that's actually what's going on. It's just kind of so outrageous that they were doing that, that you wouldn't make that connection. Oh. One thing Andy Martino's book that I didn't know is Astro players told MLB investigators during their interviews that Jose Altuve, Jose Altuve, quote, didn't want to pitch it and would sometimes become angry when teammates gave them during his at bat. And you, you show one of his at bats. So, did you have authors like Andy Martino call you to ask you about the data or well, any yeah. other people? Did you um, say to them, what did they kind of get from you? Or did they, uh, I talked with Andy. You it a certain way. I mean, what? Uh, I talked with Andy. I know I've been interviewed quite a bit for this, and um, uh, I'm always worried that um, people are trying to sensationalize the, the, the situation. I wanted to do this as an Astros fan. Um, uh, so that I could present the data in um, kind of a clinical way, you know, not with any sort of sensationalism. Uh, I didn't want somebody like John Boy to get this data and start putting it out there and, and you know, um, uh, making t-shirts out of it or whatever. Um, I really wanted to uh, make sure that uh, uh, it was treated, uh, I don't want to say with respect, but just kind of a, a matter of factly. Um, so it, I talked with Andy and, um, and explain the data and, and, and tried to, to kind of guide him with what it said. And uh, whenever I talked with any of those people, when I was listening to, this, um, to the games, it was always a gap. Uh, I would hear bang, 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 and then a gap of 10 or 12 pitches. And that was actually Jose Altuve and Josh Reddick. They were usually uh, back to back in the, in the lineup. And Josh Reddick didn't use the, the banging system either. His career year. Yeah. So, um, uh, and I wasn't really paying attention to the player. I was just listening to the bang, marking down how many, if I heard something and hitting next. And then so um, uh, after a while, I started to look at the data for, for, for players. And that's when I saw that Jose Altuve had 24 bangs, but a lot of those were early in the season and were probably not bangs. And um, uh, the other 19, if you look at his, um, um, let's see here. Correa interview, they said Jose tried it for like four games and then he quit. He didn't want it anymore. There, here. Well, it'll probably be early that he didn't. Yeah, if you look at, at the actual thing, I'm getting there. <laughs> What's going on here? Let me go restart this here real quick. So I guess my question is, what, what do you think about people who basically label Altuve as the ultimate villain of the whole thing? I mean, what, what do you think about that kind of uh, it, 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 it
okay, he did not cheat. And it, it angers me that he's become the, the, the poster child of this because, um, you know, he's such a great guy. And, um, and to sit there uh, and when everyone else is doing it and, and not do it, that I think speaks kind of to his character. Um, and uh, again, you know, like with the buzzer thing with John Boy, all that stuff, it, it, it's, um, it's extremely <laughs> infuriating to me because we all know what kind of a character he is. And, and, and um, who was that? Uh, Jose Altuve. John Boyd. Uh, John Boyd. John Boyd Media. Okay. He's the one who, who started the puzzle. John Boyd. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Then he is the one off Chapman and they ripped his jersey yeah. off. His teammates did to show there's no buzzer. That was cool. Have you tried to look at other teams, listen to the same data for the Yankees, the Dodgers? Or I have, and, um, and I haven't found anything. And again, they probably did not use an audio signal. If they were doing it, they would use the original signal. The Apple Watch thing the Well, the Apple Watch was usually a, a, with the runner on seconds. And that's another thing. If you look at the games, particularly game five, Correa had talked about this in his uh, interview with Ken uh, uh, Rosenthal. Um, there was a lot of the big plays, there was a man on second. And if there's a man on second, the uh, the the uh, pitching team is the visiting team is is uh, changing the signals a lot more. So this they didn't really there were no bangs during that period, uh, and it's, it's harder to pick up on on, on the signals because you don't have the, the pattern. No no bangs are most Friday. I haven't heard any. Right, say for sure. So when Jeff Fisher's on second, right in game five, right breaking the dust, right. There's, you would not hear a bang even in the regular season because the the, the, uh, the signals are being changed so frequently. Despite all the noise. Right. Was there a carryover to 28th? The, in 2018, they um they weren't banging on the trash can, but they were still decoding signals in real time and then relaying those to a, to a runner on second, which is still technically, I mean, it, it is illegal, but it, it's on, on a different level. It's, it's not the same as a real time signal. Yeah. Let me show you here. So this is um, this is the actual website that I created. If we go to um, Jose Altuve's at bats with bangs, so here is one. You can see that the green um, bars are, are right. making pitches, which it should be signaled if they were using the, uh, the system. <laughs> you can see here that the sinker is not um, signaled, but the one right after it is, and um, the uh, pitch after that that should be signaled. Oh, I'm sorry, that should not be signaled. Uh, um, the, the, the should bang is, then the other three should bangs, these change ups in the slider. There's no signal there, there's no banging there. So it's usually the first pitch, uh, first breaking uh, ball in his at bat that's signaled, which, which goes back to um, what Correa was saying that they would often make mistakes and um, Altuve would get upset about it. I think oh, they, that's nice. and we're focused on the catcher's um, mitt and you know his crotch looking for the signal. So what's the is the green the banging or the non-green the banging? Uh, here, let me show you. The dark red is uh, um, here. The, this red here is a bang. Oh, that's the bang. Right. So if it's green, if it's dark green, that means it should have been should have bang. There should be a bang. It's a breaking ball, and there was. If there is a uh, light green, it's uh, it means it was a, a non-breaking ball and there was no bang. So here there was there should be a bang, but there was no bang. So you can see here this is a good example. Uh, the first uh, breaking ball was signaled, but the rest of them weren't. And if you come down here, you can see uh, just going through all of his at bats. Yeah, they, they don't fit the pattern of the other other players. If I go back through and let's take a look at at Marvin Gonzalez. I don't mean to pick on him, but he had the most bangs. <laughs> he also got a big contract out of all this. So. Yeah. Yeah. That was the very disappointing. He was what? Uh, he, he had a lot. He, he participated. So here you can see um, this is a good at bat here. All these are, are fastballs, and there should not be a bang, and there was no bang. The last three pitches are all breaking balls, which should signaled and they were signaled uh, and you can see the, the one right after it and the, the, the bat struck out anyway. <laughs> so you can see that this 
This looks completely different from what, what we saw with Altuve. Altuve is it was usually the first breaking ball, then nothing. Um, and um, the video that you, you said frequently, there's three or four uh, videos where he gets a signal and even before the pitch hits, the catcher catches the pitch, Altuve's staring at the, the dugout. He's glaring into the dugout. He's like, really? Uh, and you never see that type of emotion from Altuve. He's obviously mad. He's just glaring right at the dugout and, and walking away and, and, and um, you know, taking about 10 seconds to collect himself. And so it, it seems very clear to me that he did not want to, he didn't want to participate, and when they did mistakenly bang during his at bats, he, um, he would get mad. Okay. So, um, so each player is here. You can see this is if you see all green, I mean that that player is getting all the signals right, and they're they're participating um, uh, fully in this. Um, so, and also Josh Reddick was another player that 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 didn't uh, uh, participate, but here this shows up. Uh, how many correct bangs they got for the whole season. Um, and you can um, see that uh, Marwin Gonzalez got 30 correct bangs, 30%, um, I'm sorry. So 30% uh, of, of, the, the, of the, the breaking balls were correctly signaled to him for the season. So 70%? 30%, 30%, uh, well, no. Um, uh, there was part, part, uh, either they weren't hadn't started yet, or it was a fastball. So thirty percent is what? Thirty uh, percent of the total pitches he saw. He had four hundred forty-five pitches that should have been signaled breaking balls, and he had um, uh, one hundred thirty-six that were correct. So. Um, now you have to look at it as uh, again they they weren't doing it the whole season they're only doing about yeah, that's really a much smaller percentage than I thought they were doing you think they were doing <laughs> 70 80 percent of the pitches the way everybody carries on the reality is is that it started in uh, um I thought he was pulling a George Brett very late May and ended in late September it was maybe you know 40 so games 40 games and um that's not a lot. Um, it's still obviously it's, it's wrong, but if you think about like somebody using uh, 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 you know sticky stuff, they're doing that every game, you know, yeah. hauling away, and every pitch, uh, and it's never wrong. <laughs> it's always it's always working. Um, Gary Cole made a lot of money off. <laughs> so um, here here's Josh Reddick down here too. So. Um, you can see this is all of his at bats, and you don't see the same pattern that you saw with with uh, Marvin Gonzalez. So, but again, uh, the studies that have shown that uh, it was a benefit when it was the signals were correct, but it was a, a big uh, negative when they were wrong. So it ended up kind of being a wash. How about Gaddis in Southern Hawaii? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 At 11 for his career. So you can see here uh, early in the season, you don't see any. As we scroll down, you'll start to see them. Um, <clears throat> here we can see some more down here. Um, here in what month now? Yeah. This is uh, it, it, late June. So now we're starting to see, you can see when we start to see these uh, dark greens and all the greens. Uh, our correct signals are he correct. Had a great June too. Got eighteen homers in June. One thing about uh, Josh Reddick though is that he had the most wrong signals. So maybe the person who was signaling him wasn't a big fan of his. <laughs> there were quite a few that were. Hated wrestling. <laughs> if you look at this, all these uh, red lines, these dark red lines, are incorrect signals. And he had quite a few of them. <laughs> Did you hear from MLB after you after you came out with your? I, I never heard anything from them. Really? No, no. Um, Did you hear from the Astros? I did not. Did you get really? a graph yeah. off of green? 
I, I'm not sure how they feel about it, honestly. I'm not sure if this, I, I know that MLB doesn't like this type of information being out there. And honestly, they should have been doing this, not me. Um, they should have been providing this. And, and if you look, read the, 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 the letter from Manfred, uh, he says that there was no way to tell which players were participating when obviously there was their work or there was a way to tell it. And I don't know if they just didn't mm -hmm. think about this or they didn't do it. To kind of give everybody that immunity that was promised, right? Well, I can't like an LD when we share that kind of data. Well, the, the issue is that they lumped all the players in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there were players that didn't participate, like Altuve and Reddit. Yeah. And uh, obviously, it's it, they knew what was going on, but um, uh, a lot of players know that other players are cheating, and I don't know that anybody's ever stopped them. I mean, I don't. Has there ever been an instance that you know of a player stopping another player from cheating? Um, a teammate. It, it's just it's such a it's such a part of the the sport that that you know they almost kind of laugh at it and that, that it's almost expected. Supposedly they 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 were stealing signs when Bobby Johnson hit the home run off front. Yeah, so they shot it around the world. But they were stealing signs for sure. I don't think there's a, you know, I don't think there's an issue or a problem. One way to stand with the trash cans or with somebody stealing the signs. MLB's problem with this, as I read it, was the method that the Astros used. They were using technology in, right. instead of baseball sense or eyesight or something. Obviously, right. runners on second base. Sent forever have, 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 have been picking up signs, or if you can detect from the pitcher's delivery, all that's fair game. The is a, from from MLB's standpoint, their problem was the methodology. Also, after the Apple Watch, right, right. the memo from the Apple the, the, with the Red Sox and the Apple Watch, um, um, the, the memo went out, and the, all teams were supposed to stop, and um, and the Astros didn't stop. Um, and that that was the biggest issue. If you read the, the letter, uh, it was August. Uh, it was August or early September or, or late August. 2017. Yeah. And so there, there was maybe two weeks, three weeks after that, that the season ended. So it wasn't that much after that that the Astros were still using it. Well, I think this is a point when you come out or because I listen to MLB all the time, and a lot of, especially when they start talking about, you know, when it comes to Hall of Fame and so forth, and talking about Altuve, it's he believes to have a stigma on him right. that for the Hall of Fame. Right. And I think this right here, this type of data, at least for um, the people, it would be useful down the road. Yeah. And <clears throat> when I was uh, recording the data, uh, Obviously, I, I started to notice that, that Altuve wasn't participating. And, um, but this was before uh, the Manfred letter came out and some other information came out. And it all fits together. Everything points to him not participating. Um, uh, all the video, the evidence that we have, the, the data that I have, the, the player testimonies under, under oath, not under oath, but if, if the players had lied to MLB, they would have lost their immunity. So they're not going to lie about one player. Um, and they all said that, that uh, Altuve did not participate. Um, so I think that uh, you're starting to see uh, uh, the press come around to that. And you see that more often that people are talking that he did not, did not cheat. Um, um, fans, on the other hand, are, are they're never going to forgive him or they're never going to believe it. Well, I'm, I'm, you know, yeah. I'm going to say the Yankees are going to say they want their ring because they have the LPS. It's like, okay, how many runs did you get in the last game? Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Four for the uh, at last yeah. count, we stole the 2017 World Series from four different teams. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Runs, I think it was. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Thank you Thank you. I'm sorry. I, I just not a very good speaker. Right. I usually am. I David, the floor is yours. Let's spend a few minutes talking about your book. Go ahead, David. David is a, oh, I'm sorry.
David is a professor of history. So we got that uh, connection there, David. <laughs> David is a, can you hear me, David? Yes. Okay. I can hear you. David is a professor of history at Texas A&M. Uh, America's finest university. Besides the University of Houston, of course. Uh, <laughs> so in addition to Spitter, David has also written um, The Farmer's Game, Baseball in Rural America. Uh, he was born and raised in Northern California. and is a lifelong fan of the Giants. So you're... You must be really happy about Korea, David. <laughs> uh, but since his arrival to Texas in 97, he has been cheering for the Astros. So, David, give us a few minutes of uh, Gaylor Perry, your book. Okay, thank you, Joe. Can you hear me? Yes, Joe. Yes. So the uh, <clears throat> book was a real labor of love, of love for me. Uh, so thanks very much for letting me share it with you a bit. So the top uh, blurb on the back of the book uh, comes from George Will. And it ends, read the first paragraph of this Cracker Jack book and you will be hooked. So I'm going to start, I'd be a fool otherwise, I'm going to start by reading you that paragraph. And in fact, the first two paragraphs because they, they lay out the book's uh, central theme and, and narrative arc, and will give you a taste of it. Uh, then I'll elaborate a bit before taking your questions. And of course, this is actually related to Tony's subject. Anyway, Gaylord Jackson Perry threw a spitter for the first but hardly the last time in his career on the night of May 31st, 1964, before a record Shea Stadium crowd of 57,037. The circumstances were dire. The San Francisco Giants and New York Mets in the second game of the longest doubleheader in Major League history, nearly 10 hours of playing time, were locked in a 6-6 tie in the bottom of the 13th inning. General Manager Alvin Dark, Giants Manager Alvin Dark, waved Perry in from the bullpen with little confidence. He was the 11th pitcher on the Giants' 11-man pitching staff and the only option left, except for Bob Henley, who was supposed to start the next day. With six years in and out of the minors, an ordinary fastball, an inconsistent curve, and an earned run average of 4.77 and just seven appearances so far that year, the 25-year-old Perry had every reason to believe that his career hung in the balance. So too did his catcher, Tom Haller, who upon greeting Perry on the mound after two shaky innings said simply, Gaylord, it's time to try it out. They both knew what he meant. Under the tutelage of teammate Bob Shaw and Giants minor league pitching coach Frank Schellenbach, Perry had been diligently working on his special and illegal pitch for over a year. How to load it up, how big a load the ball would carry, where to drop the load, how to grip the ball, how to release it, how to control it, and how to hide it from the umpires and the entire opposing team. We're not high school boys anymore, Shaw told him in no uncertain terms. Hitters are taking the bread out of your mouth. Bread had always been an issue for Perry. The son of a tobacco sharecropper in Eastern North Carolina, Perry learned to survive by whatever means necessary. As he came of age in the 1940s and 1950s, tobacco farming remained pre-modern, unmechanized, labor-intensive, and poverty-stricken. The Perry family's yearly routine demanded hard, unrelenting work, 
and afforded few pleasures, baseball chief among them. Throughout his major league career, Perry would again learn to survive by whatever means necessary. In this game, he said in a rare moment of candor, in this game, you got to do what it takes. If it takes being mean, you be mean. If it takes brushing a hitter back, you brush him back. If it takes being wet, you moisten up. And sure enough, with his spitter splashing and Haller's met, Perry pitched 10 scoreless innings of relief to beat the Mets last night, that night, finished the 1964 season with 12 victories as a starter, and went on to become one of the premier pitchers of his generation. Perry returned to his farming roots and Southern way of life, even before retiring from the game in 1983. But this time his survival skills met with disaster. Overextended and deeply in debt, he could not prevent his 410 acre farm from failing in 1986 during the decade's devastating agricultural crisis. Baseball had offered Perry an outlet for the tensions of rural life and a means of translating a core set of values into action. But prosperity on the farm, he learned, depended on a much crueler reality. It rested not just on hard work, determination and resiliency, but on favorable market conditions over which, unlike the spitter, he had no control. So my hope is that readers will get to know up close and personal, uh, a life rich in human interest and a personality of considerable complexity. Before, during, and after his career in baseball, Perry cleaved to the values and approach to life instilled in him as, as a tenant boy's farmer's boy. Outspoken, cocky, and intensely loyal. He was also moody, impulsive with money, and inclined to be surly. His fierce competitive nature defined him as both a pitcher and a farmer. And his 314 wins, 3,534 strikeouts, 303 complete games and 690 starts, 5,350 innings, and two Cy Young awards, one in each league. All of that propelled him into the National Baseball Hall of Fame. It was a spitter, even more so, that made Perry famous or infamous, depending on one's perspective. He became the poster child for that well-known baseball player's maxim, if he ain't cheating, he ain't trying. Then in addition to Perry's character, his Hall of Fame accomplishments on the field and his outlaw status, he also led a life of considerable significance in modern American history. In particular, with regards to issues of race, the profound changes in agriculture and rural life that he experienced on the farm, the ethics of cheating in the sport, and heretofore uh, hidden links in, that his career brought to light between rural Southern culture and more broadly American popular culture. Two other main sub themes of the book uh, are Gaylord's fierce lifelong sibling rivalry with his brother Jim and his life after his career as a professional immortal. Uh, as one sports writer dubbed the new breed of retired ball players who emerged 
in the 1980s to make large sums of money selling autographs and memorabilia. So the book is written for a broad range of audiences. Uh, first and foremost, readers who love baseball and who love history. Uh, those with the passion for the game who are not scared off by historical arguments or footnotes. In other words, folks, folks just like you all. So I, I'd be glad now to field uh, whatever questions you might have. What was the source of his rivalry with Jim? Well, uh, his child, the childhood, really, um, these were really poor people. Um, the reason, the primary reason they had children was because their children would grow up to be laborers uh, on, on the farm. Uh, Jim was three years older than Gaylord. So Jim, uh, both Jim and Gaylord took on uh, adult responsibilities on the farm as soon as they turned seven years old. So Jim was the favored one uh, from almost the get go uh, by his parents and especially his father. Uh, Jim was, frankly, for Jim was better looking. <laughs> he was smarter. He was much more practical in his in his approach uh, to life, and much more successful right away. Uh, Jim, uh, I believe, reached the major leagues in just his third year of professional baseball, the Cleveland Indians, um, and. Uh, broke in and had had two or three really good years right off the bat uh just don't just drove drove gaylord crazy uh these were when they were growing up in the in the 40s and 50s um these these two boys like never left the farm uh until jim went to high school they were together every almost literally every minute and every day and even every minute of every night because they slept together in the same bed so that their body heat would give them create them heat um after jim went to high school uh, you can probably count on your hands on two hands or certainly four hands the number of times that they uh saw each other uh, socially the rest of their lives. You got a question? Yeah, did, Go did Gaylord Perry, did he uh, use the spinner throughout his uh, professional career? No, he, no. so he, st he starts uh, right out of high school uh in the Giants organization, got a big bonus. That was another big reason for the our symptom of the rivalry. Um, Jim, uh, going back to the first question, then Jim, when Jim signed in '56, uh, the rules were such that you you couldn't pay a player more than a four thousand dollar bonus unless you put him on the major league roster. Uh, that changed the summer before Gaylord's uh, senior year. Uh, so when Gaylord signed in, I believe, May of 1958, Gaylord signed for $73,500. Uh, that'll start your rivalry for you. <laughs> uh, but he, he, uh, he struggled. Um, again, he's, he's in the minors, uh, starting in Class C at St. Cloud, Minnesota. Um, moved to uh, Corpus Christi in the Texas League the next couple of years, um, and then to Tacoma where the Giants were training in AAA, up and down for two years in 63 and 64. He didn't actually throw the spitter again until this that fateful night in May of 1964. 
And then he threw it for the rest of his career. Maxwell. Maxwell, yeah. Yes, I, I had a question for you, David. Um, you wrote in the book that in spring training of 1962, Gaylord Perry was one of 10 Giants pitchers competing for two spots. How, therefore, did Topps know to put him on a card all by himself that year, not a multiplayer card, and it was a low-numbered card in the set? So they, they must have known he had the talent to make the Giants rotation that year. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know when the when the cards are even. Do you know when when are the when when the cards are made? Well, his card would have been season. His, his card would have been in the second or third series, and the first series came out in January, and each subsequent series was six weeks later. So it would have been at the very latest April. Um. Well, he doesn't. He doesn't make the team that he doesn't make the team that year. Uh, uh, he had a, a bunch of rivals at the time. Um, he doesn't make the team until the last week or even the last his last outing in spring training, um, and he's really the last of several pitchers who weren't having very good year. Didn't have a very good spring. So I, I don't know the answer to your question uh, in all candor. What does a spitter do to a baseball? Um, well, I can show you, actually. I, I don't know how well you can see it, but I can sort of talk you through um, how, and at least how, how he threw it. So most pitches are thrown with your um, – index finger and middle finger across the seams one way or another. And when you, when you release the ball, the ball rolls off your index finger and middle finger to create backspin. Um, this is how we're, you know, we're obsessed with spin rate uh, these days. But the, the objective of the spitter is to do, have, is the exact opposite objective. The spitter is thrown, at least the way Gaylord threw it, his, his index finger and middle finger are, are not on the seams. They're in the sort of the so-called horseshoe part of the baseball. And the uh, foreign substance, which is the official phrase of Major League Baseball since 1920, your foreign substance of choice uh, is, will be beneath your index finger and middle finger. And then you, he would grip the ball way out at the end of his hand, uh, like that. And he'd say, grip it at, and squeeze it like you're squeezing an orange. Then when you, when you throw the ball, right, because there's so little, the, the spit lessens the friction between the ball and your index finger and middle finger. When you, when you throw the ball, and it was, he threw it just like a fastball, same motion, same speed. When you throw the ball, the pitch instead of coming off your middle index finger and your middle and your your index finger and your middle finger, it rolls off your thumb. Right. So he describes it as like squeezing a watermelon seed between your thumb and your middle finger and index finger. Right. So when you throw it that way, the ball comes out and has. As all, well, not no spin, but as little spin as possible. So on a ball so thrown, by the time it gets to the plate, uh, 60 feet, six inches, and gravity has, put, has uh, done its work on it, by the time it gets to a plate, uh, what looks like a fastball coming in at waist high or thigh high drops off the table uh, when it gets to the plate. It's an extremely difficult pitch to throw, you have to have really strong hands. Uh, working on the farm, since age seven, uh, gave him that. He was a strong guy anyway, just uh, you know, 6'4", 190, 200 pounds. A um, lot of pitchers try throwing the spitter. It takes a, it takes tremendous toll on on your arm. It takes great hand strength and great arm strength. 
And then because the pitch is illegal, I mean, you've got to have the guts of a burglar uh, to, to throw it, uh, which, which he did. How did. How did he hide it from the, uh, from the ops? Well, it depends on it depends on what you're talking about. There's a there's a key, the key year at the end of the before the end of the through the 67, 1967 season, right? You could go, you could legally go to your mouth while you're while you're on the mound, right? And most pitchers like to go to their mouth because it it gives you better better uh, grip on the ball, just like, just like when you want to turn a page, you would go to your mouth to, to turn, turn a page. So you could go to your mouth while you're on the mound, as long as you're wiped off, right? It's in the rules, rule 8.02 in the major league rules, as long as you're wiped off. Uh, but of course you can wipe off, you could, you could wipe off, but raise your, raise your middle finger and index finger just enough so that the spit stays on it. After 67, uh, the spitter is a, is a big deal in, the, in major leagues in the 60s. Um, after 67, the, rules, the rule 8.02 is amended so that you can no longer go to your mouth while you're on the mound. So that's, that's the year in, uh, bef between the, the off season before 68 season where spitballers have to go to a, another type of foreign substance, uh, which would normally be uh, you know, Vaseline, KY jelly, that sort of thing. And he had to learn his career is on the line. I mean, he's, it depends on that pitch. Um, and he had to learn a whole new a whole new uh, method of doctoring the ball. Um, and he did. And it was even more successful. Um, Vaseline works, uh, again, the way you throw it, the vas Vaseline was even more effective than, than spit. And he threw that, threw that pitch for the rest of his career, which didn't end until 1983. Anyone else? Um, David, I don't know if you have a copy, but if you want to pick up a copy of the book, here it is. Here, let me get closer. It's better. My uh, hardcover copy arrived today. Just in time for Christmas for me. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, huh? Excellent. Hey, no problem. Uh, when I come to A&M, uh, maybe I'll get you to uh, autograph it for me. <laughs> yeah. um, anyone else got a question for David? All right. Uh, thank you, David. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. And if you you want to hear his presentation again, come to the uh, winter meeting, you know, at the uh, Bill Gilbert, the Roger Hornsby chapter, uh, January 7th. But before we're... Before we have our trivia contest tonight, I would just like to well, uh, just like to thank every one of our speakers this year. Gave me a great first year as chapter president. I'm going to name them off. Terry Poole last month. Uh, Dan Taylor, if you remember. Chris Rawls from September. Uh, David Krell. Arlene Lassen. Ted Meyer right here. Uh, Gaspar Gonzalez. Mike Rotnoy. Mike Caps. Astros play-by-play -play announcer Robert Ford, uh, Mike McCraw, uh, Mike Acosta, not you, Mike, <laughs> Bill Boudreaux, and tonight, of course, Tony Adams and David Vaught. It's been a great 2022. This is why all you first-timers should come back. All right, all these great speakers. Um, on on deck for January is Allison Footer. Um, so. We are having a trivia contest, courtesy of Tal and Mike, right? Right. Um, those of you online, if you want to stay on for that. If not, happy holidays. I'll see you again in the middle of January. But so let's have our trivia contest, Mike. Right. Thank you again. No more ethics. What? <laughs>
Yes, we've had two topics of cheating, so I don't, I don't want any of you guys just carrying on the theme of no. trivia kind of thing. But you are allowed to team up groups of two or say, three right? or more. Yeah, that's how talent I think. No, no, just regular question. No, it has a theme. Uh, I just wanted to say I didn't get the pleasure of meeting Gaylord Perry at a Giants reunion in 2003. Autographed a ball for me, and I shook his hand, and then I looked at my hand, <laughs> and it was dry. So he was a pretty nice guy. <laughs> I didn't have to pay for it either. Does everybody have one? Right here. Mike, you gonna read these out for people? I'm gonna read them out. For those who don't have it, then Tal's gonna do the end. All right. So you know we had a very unusual <laughs> World Series. <laughs> at least look at it. I'll look at it. But it'll in fact, I'm it. the same way. Don't worry about it. As of the fact that we had a no hitter pitch in the World Series for the first time since 1956. Not only that, but it was a combined no-hitter, and it was the second combined no-hitter that the Astros had thrown that year. So that gave me an idea for a theme, and I called up Tal, and the next day he called me, and he had this whole quiz written. <laughs> <laughs> very efficient. Very efficient. You know the answer, then. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> By the way, I was going to ask you while I'm up here, do you want to try to put together a saber thing for the bananas? Do I want to try to put something together? Something inside of the sugar one. Difficult to guess. What? But people in this room probably... I don't know. Y'all never heard of them. I just recently heard about them, like when last year... First game was sold out, and everybody's on a wait list for the rest of the game. And it's like, it is like the Globetrotters. Yeah, it's it's not really a baseball game. game. A guy bought a minor league team, and they just put on a show. And they have different okay. rules, like you have to run to first base backwards or just stuff like, and they do tricks with the bats. And like, as, the, as the owner says, it's baseball specifically for the fan. Yeah. That's that's what he said, specifically for the fan. If you're a baseball purist, you won't like it, but if you want to go name? out and <laughs> see the Harlem Globetrotters or the Marx Brothers or the Three Stooges, yeah, you'll like it. Playing baseball. All right, here's the here's the quiz. Uh, number one on June eleventh, two thousand three, the Houston Astros set a major league record by using six pitchers in a no hit win over the New York Yankees in New York. Name the Houston pitchers. You can team up. You don't have to do it by yourself. It's not cheating. Unless the whole room is in one team. Then you're sure to win. Yeah. We won the game. All right. That's not one of the questions. You were in New York? Pardon me? You were in New York? For the the day after. I was in New York the night. Then you ought to get this question. This is the one. Okay, on June 25th of this past season, Astros repeated this by no hitting the Yankees again in New York, which was the first new hit no hitter pitched against the Yankees since they did it in 2003. This time they only needed three pitchers. Name those three pitchers. One point each or three points. So I got a theme going here. In game four. Of this year's World Series, four Houston pitchers threw a World Series no hitter for the first time since Don Larson's perfect game in '56 against the against the Dodgers. Name the four pitchers that threw the no hitter against the Phillies in Game Four. One point for each one you can remember. This isn't that easy of a quiz. No. Last month was easy. Hmm? Last month was that's why I won. <laughs> Dal said he couldn't get this one. He couldn't get all the answers. I said you wrote all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing here. 
That's why he's giving the answers. <laughs> uh, number four. Anybody need any more time? How are we doing? Everybody back there okay? Maxwell? Maxwell, yeah. yeah. Uh, Maxwell had already finished the quiz, right? Oh, you already finished the quiz. <laughs> you need number one. Okay. Uh, I'm still working on the six no hitter pitchers from 2003. <laughs> yeah. Uh, four Houston pitchers pitched another combined. Give you all a break on this one. No hitter in 2019 against Seattle. They used five pitchers. And I don't recall another team used, having any. As many combined no hitters as Houston has pitched. Two of the winning pitchers that pitched for the Astros were making their pitching debuts for Houston. They'd been in acquired in a trade, and that was their first game. They both came from the same team. So name either one of the two pitchers or the team we got them from for one point. That was in 2019, just a few years ago. We went to the World Series, too. But, man, we have a better bullpen this year than we did then. Yeah. Okay. There are six pitchers in Major League history who have pitched two no-hitters in one season. Complete <clears throat> games. Name each of the six for one point each. Total of six points. And one of the six through his second no hitter of the season in the playoffs. So it was a postseason no hitter. The other five were regular season no hitters. <clears throat> See, I do have a theme here, Chris. You see, they're mostly about no hitters. Yeah, I'm working on it. Okay. Number six. The Astros have had three pitchers. This is Tal's most devious question. <laughs> who have been involved in two or more no hit games as Astros? Three pitchers that have been involved in two. Or more no hit games as an Astro. For one point each, name the three pitchers. Next one's another <clears throat> Tal Smith question he Googled. 15 Astro pitchers have pitched complete game no hitters. Uh, how many are left handers? <laughs> and name them. If you get the answer right, you get two. Mm. Hmm? This is why. <laughs> now, the next question, I realized how old I was. Because this was big news when it happened. <clears throat> Some of you weren't even born. Uh, in 1970, Preston Gomez, while managing managing the Padres, made big news by pulling a pitcher who had a no-hitter in progress. This was just unheard of at the time. And was big news. A few years later, in 1974, while managing the Astros, he did it again. Pulling a pitcher with a no hitter in progress. Now each pitcher was losing at the time, having given up a run. But <clears throat> name each of the two pitchers for one point each that Preston Gomez. And these were probably the first two pitchers that were pulled in Major League history while pitching a no hitter because you you just always let the guy in before that. And there were a lot more complete games than there are now. And in all fairness, one of them I've never heard of.
Okay, this past 2022 season, there was a starting pitcher in the majors who was pulled a major league record three times while pitching a no-hitter and qualifying for the win. And he won all three games. Naming for one point, one pitcher, one point. Now keep it up with me. Bobby away. <laughs> yeah. All right. Now we're going to a little history. Harvey Haddix, lefty, famously pitched 12 perfect innings against the Braves in 1959 before losing in the 13th. Who broke up the no-hitter with the game-winning hit? And who was the winning pitcher? Very famous game. Lots of baseball cards about it. Thompson, are you writing answers or doodling? Because you're the only one writing. <laughs> uh, I'm beyond that. <laughs> uh, okay. Everybody remembers Don Larson's perfect game, two to nothing. 56 against the Dodgers. Who was the opposing pitcher? And what hitter made the last out? One point for each. Two point. Well, I that. that was Kevin Bass. I remember seeing. Kevin Bass was not the correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> At least not to this question. That was an 86 question. This is 56. Kevin Bass is always the answer. <laughs> That's it. Uh, number 12, there are five pitchers in modern Major League Baseball history who have pitched three or more no-hitters. And hit. This is in modern history. Because there's actually six. There's one guy that did it in the 1890s, but I didn't want to put him. For one point each, name the five pitchers who have pitched three or more no-hitters. Yes, Nolan Ryan is one of them. You don't know that. You shouldn't be. Twice. <laughs> That's right. More than double. Thirteen. Of the five pitchers in question 12, question I just asked, the pit, people that pitched three or more no-hitters, two of them pitched a perfect game. Only two. Name the two perfect game pitchers for one point each. All right, now we're into local history. Who pitched the first no-hitter by an Astro? May 17th, 1963. He won four to one. Number 15. What Astro pitcher was the losing pitcher in his only no hitter on April 23rd, 1964? Runner reached on an error by the pitcher. And scored the winning run. He lost one to nothing. It was Pete Rose that scored the run. Okay, getting tougher now. What Astro pitcher threw a no hitter to clinch a finish? In what year? One point for each. The year of the pitcher. <laughs> All right. Final question. What Astro pitcher threw a no-hitter resulting in free beer for all the fans in the park? Mm. One point. How many beers were served? <laughs> you were responsible for the last three or four of those are your questions. Yeah, I had four <laughs> beers. 
didn't get them to the eighth inning. <laughs> he drank the most beers. The guy. The... <laughs> Anyone want any of the questions repeated? Anybody need a question repeated? Mike asked. I think we're ready, Mike. Well, then Sal's here with the answers. All right, then. Okay, I'm going to sit the wall like the no, answer so I can refer to my refer to my answer sheet. Question number one: The Astros combined no hitter 2003, six pitchers. Anybody want to start with the answers? Oswald. Oswald was a starter. That's right. Hotel. Pete Monroe. Somebody said that he was a second pitcher. Jotel was in there? Jotel was uh, next to last. Wagner was in there. Wagner, Lidge. Wagner finished up. Lidge, probably. Lidge uh, pitched. He was the fourth pitcher. You're missing the third one. Kirk Sarlos. Oh, that's. You can forget him. That's not everyone. Was Lidge one of them or not? Yes, he was. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. Oswald, Monroe, Sarlos, Lidge, Jotel, and Wagner. Question number two, the combined no-hitter in uh, June of this year. Three pitchers. Who, who was the starter? Javier. Javier was the starter. Was Neris? Neris was the second pitcher. And Presley. And Presley finished up. Right. Ooh. Well done. Look at Joe. Oh, two, I got it right except for that last Question one. number three, uh, the combined no-hitter in the World Series this year. Four pitchers. Who started? Javier. Javier again, right. Garcia. Uh, uh, who followed him? You said Garcia. Is it Brian Abreu? Abreu is right. Yes. Followed again by Montero. Montero is correct. And Preston. 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 Right. Very good. Very good. Oh, man. That deal. Uh, the fourth one, the combined no-hitter in 2019 against Seattle. Uh, anybody know Aaron Sanchez and Joe BG? Aaron, Aaron Sanchez, is good. Starter. the man right there. Yeah, really? yeah, much, much better. Both uh, 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 I have to correct Mike, though. There's only <laughs> so you say five, there's only four. Sanchez started, believed by Harris, Biagini, and Davinsky. What number is that? What's four number four? I did make a mistake. They were only four. But I proved this and I uh, changed the order of the pictures. And so, uh, I didn't change the place. I'll see what we had on the road. Okay. Anyway, question number five. I think that four pictures. What team were they from? Well, was was team was Toronto. We made a trade yeah. with Toronto. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Sanchez and Biagini. Forget who we traded. Sanchez and Biagini yeah. came from Blue Jays. The four pitchers again were Sanchez, Harris, Biagini, and Davinsky. Uh, question five. Six pitchers in Major League history who pitched two no hitters in one season. One of them threw it in the postseason. Howard Allen. Allen is the last one. Right. The others, one is very obvious, double no hit. Like they in there. It's who else? Lay Reynolds. Uh, Bob uh, Feller. Oh. Oh, Lay Bob Reynolds. Feller. No. Who no. said Bob Feller? Yeah. Isn't that right? No. 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 I'm wrong. no. Johnny Vandermeer. Allie oh, Reynolds. That. Allie Reynolds. Virgil Fire Trucks. Yeah. Nolan Ryan. And Max Scherzer. Again, Vandermeer, Reynolds, Trucks, Ryan, Scherzer, Halliday. Trucks was five and twelve that year. We see no this. Did you win this contest? And you said you're no Ryan to retire. <laughs> no. Question six: Astros have had three pitchers involved in two or more no hit games. Nolan. No. Presley. Presley is right. He's finished up two of them. Well done. That, 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 Christian Harvey. That, 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 
Right. That, that, that's that's the first one. Right. That's that's right. right here. I'll be here. Who's the other one? Who's the first one? Don Wilson. Don Wilson. Mm. Right. Man. Don that's Wilson. I'll be here. Presley. Brian only pitched one for the Astros. That's right. Good job coming up with Presley. That was sort of the trick. Uh, devious. Seven. Fifteen Astro pitchers have pitched complete game, no hitters. Who are the left-handers? How many of them? One? Uh, one. None. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Zero. Two. Austin. Question: Preston Gomez pulled a pitcher of the Padres in 1970. Had a no hitter in progress. And he was losing the game, as Mike said. Who was the pitcher? Blake Kirby. Blake Kirby is correct. Who said Blake Kirby? Very good. Good job. Happened again with Preston uh, four years later here in Houston. Who was the pitcher? 1974 Astros. Don Wilson. Oh, so he could add three no hitters. Preston Bully. But they probably got two points. Got West Wilson. That's good. Question, question nine. Uh, starting pitcher in 2022. Pulled a major league record three times with pitching a no hitter. Berlin. Berlin. Yeah. Five yeah. in, six innings, and five in. Good job. Uh, question 10. Uh, Haddix, this uh, 12 perfect innings. Who broke up the no hitter and who was a winning pitcher? Who broke up the no hitter? Go ahead. Go ahead, Cock. Warren Spawn. No. Close. Lou Burdett. I did. Burdett, it's a complete game, gave up 12 six. And Joe Adcock should have had a Grand Slam home run. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Bases loaded. So Aaron and Brad Nesson. Yeah, Aaron yeah. passed the guy yeah. who scored. Aaron yeah. went to the dugout and he passed Aaron. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Larson's perfect game. Who was the opposing pitcher? Yeah. Magley. Magley is ah. correct. Good, good job. And who... Uh, who who, uh, who was the last out? Dale, Dale Mitchell. Dale, Dale Mitchell. Well, Dale uh, Mitchell. Five pitchers in modern league history have pitched three or more no hitters. Ryan Koufax. Yeah, Ryan was seven. Somebody mentioned Koufax was four. Yeah. Berlander with three. Beller. Beller with three. Max Scherzer. Well, this two. Guy that won over 500 games. Cy Young. Cy Young. Cy Young with three. Feller three. Borlander three. Kovacs four. And Ryan seven. Uh, of those five, two of them pitched perfect games. Kovacs is one. Cy Young. Cy Young. Cy Young. Cy Young and Kovacs. Fourteen. First no hitter by an Astro in 1963. Oh, no, no. Oh, no, no, no. no. Good job. Next question. Fifteen. The losing pitcher and the only no hitter. Ken Johnson. Correct. What Astro pitcher threw a no hitter to clinch a tenant and in what year? I said 86. Okay. <laughs> what Astro pitcher threw a no-hitter resulting in three beer? And how many beers? Too many. Not enough. Not enough is the correct answer. Give me five points. <laughs> okay. Mike, Mike says there's a total of 45 possible points. How many got 45? <laughs> how many got 10? <laughs> 15. Things to get 16, 20, 20, 20, 20. 20. Yeah. 25. Oh, we're back in the 20s. 21. Joe. 22. We got three way touch. 22. 22. 23. 24. 
25. 25. 25. Right 25. 25. 25. Anybody else with 25? You win. Hey, you win. Pat on the track. Kobe, uh, you be back. Kobe, congratulations. First timer, you won, so you get a copy of Bill Brown's book. Whoa. All right, very good. Listen, I think What's that? And you get to write the quiz for next month, so you know what that means. You got to come back. And Allison Footer is going to be here, and she knows everything. Allison Footer so will probably win next month. <laughs> uh, Jimmy Lee? Uh, Jimmy was here, Jimmy Lee? Okay. Um, not only are we going to have Allison Footer speak next month, but Jimmy has volunteered to speak a few minutes about his time as an umpire. So um, be here for January. Pay attention online. I'm going to be sending out a lot of emails uh, reminding everybody about the January 7th trip to uh, San Marcos. Hopefully, all we can have like a caravan out to the winter meeting. Good you know, barbecue in that area. Good barbecue. We can hear uh, David talk again about, uh, you know, Mr. Spetter. Thank you all for a great year. Have a happy holidays. And we'll see you next year. All right? Thank you. Bye, everybody. Merry Christmas. Happy holiday. Happy Hanukkah. Yeah. That's, hello. Bye bye. Congratulations. Sorry.